Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please join with a short prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless the collective meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth, so that all that is spoken here is faithful and true, glorifies you, and enriches us through the gifts of your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. So I ask you the same question I ask the kids. Have you ever been faced with a situation that is beyond your control? Well, I'll give you a hint. For all the regular humans out there, the answer is yes. In fact, if you really sit down and think about it, it happens quite often. It may have happened to you this morning, especially if you have kids. But even if you're just by yourself going through the daily ins and outs of life, we regularly encounter things that are outside of our power to control. It can be scary and it can be frustrating, but that doesn't change the fact that it's true. Can you think of one of those moments? Maybe you have a particular one in your life that really stands out to you. Maybe it was one where God really taught you this truth, or maybe it was one where you were extremely afraid because you couldn't control what was going on around you. I can share a simple one I just had this past week. In fact, it happened yesterday morning. My wife and I were on vacation. We were getting up, packing all our stuff, wanted to get in the car and on the road because, as we've discovered, driving somewhere with a four-month-old takes a little bit longer than just with two adults. So we wanted to hit the road early. So we get our car all packed up and we drive out of the roundabout for our uh, little lake house thing we rented. And we turn onto the road and what do we see? But a tree had fallen in the road and blocked the way. There was a storm in the nighttime, I'm told. I didn't wake up. Um, but it was quite the storm and there were many trees down as we were leaving the place. But this tree had fallen right in the way. Thank goodness we didn't get up at four and try to leave, and then we would have had to wait. I tried to move it. I wasn't strong enough. The tree was too big. It was too heavy. Part of its roots still in the ground. So we had to wait, and we needed somebody to come and help us, somebody with a truck who could wrap um, a line around the tree and drag it out of the road. We, in fact, encountered another situation last night as we were driving back that made me think of this sermon today, and that we were driving in Ohio, and the weather got really bad. Another big storm was coming through, and there were warnings and watches for tornadoes, and so we had pulled off the road and were sitting under an overpass, because if a tornado comes around, there's not much you can do but just seek shelter beyond our control. Well, the disciples in our text today find themselves in a similar situation. Jesus has fed the 5,000, and he tells his disciples, get in the boat, go across the lake. I'm going to disperse the crowds, and I'll meet you over there. And so the disciples take off in the boat. And these aren't just, you know, random guys who decided to get in a boat. They're all fishers. They're all fishermen. So they've been out in a boat a number of times. They know how to handle the waves and the wind. But the text tells us that they encountered such a wind that was against them that they weren't able to make any progress. Now, this made me think of a time at summer camp where uh, I was teaching a canoeing merit badge class, and I had a bunch of 12-year-old kids, some of them very skinny, small children, and they were to do some maneuvers in a canoe. Well, it was a very windy day, and so they got blown all the way over into a cove about a quarter of a mile away. And I had to get into a canoe and go and rescue them because no matter how hard their skinny little arms were trying, they could not beat the wind. They kept going a little bit and then getting blown back. So what did I have to do? I had to go over there. I had to get them. And I had them hold on to the back of my canoe. And we had this little train of me with a bunch of little ones holding on to each successive canoe as I paddled us back to shore. Because it turns out I could handle that wind. But this was something else entirely. A bunch of grown men are as helpless as these little kids. So what now? What happens to the disciples when they find themselves in a situation 
that's beyond their control, and really what happens to us when we find ourselves in these sorts of situations. Well, in these situations, we learn from our gospel reading today that Jesus comes to us and rescues us. Now, you can separate this reading into two sections, really. One is the disciples without Jesus, and then the disciples with Jesus. And so, we're going to look at the first part where it's without Jesus before He comes to them, and then we're going to look at the part where He's with them. Because we're the disciples in this story. And so, how Jesus interacts with them is how He interacts with us. And the way that they respond to Jesus is the good, the bad, and the ugly is the way we respond to Jesus in our lives. So, without Jesus, what's the situation? They're stuck. They're in the boat, beaten by the wind and the waves. They can't get anywhere near the the land, and they're just stuck. Jesus has asked them to go to the other side, so there's another layer to this. It's not like they made a bad choice, and now they're being punished for it. They're trying to do what Jesus asked them to do, and they've encountered a situation that they can't fix, they can't deal with. And often, we find ourselves in similar situations where we're trying with all our might for many hours, and we get nowhere. We're powerless to deal with the situation we find ourselves in. It's outside of our ability to control. And to make matters worse, it isn't like it's a punishment either. So, sometimes we know that it to be true that when we're following Jesus, it's not always smooth sailing. We still encounter these situations, even when we're doing our best to try and do exactly the thing He's asked us to do. So, what needs to happen? What do the disciples need to realize? What do we need to realize in those situations? We need help. Someone needs to come and save us. So, Jesus shows up. Jesus comes, as is His usual mode, in compassion. He sees His people helpless and harassed, this time by the wind and the waves, and He's moved to compassion and enters into the situation to fix the problem. Now, the text says He comes in the fourth watch of the night, which is from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So, the disciples have been at this for a while, and you can imagine how they're feeling. It's dark. They're tired. They are exhausted. They've been trying to deal with this. I mean, if you've ever been in a boat where you're trying to work against the wind, it is tough work. So, their muscles are starting to give out, and they're probably starting to get a little scared because when your power starts to run out, you know things are not going well. They're probably thinking if we run out of energy There's no telling where we're going to end up. We're just going to be helpless in the face of this wind. Well, into this situation walks Jesus. I say walks because He's literally walking on the sea, the text tells us. And contrary to what you might expect, Jesus' presence is not initially comforting to His disciples, mostly because they don't recognize Him. The text says, but when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. So, Jesus shows up thinking He's going to help the situation, and all of His disciples start screaming, there's a ghost. I'm mean, sort of imagining this in a cartoon setting. They're all kind of running around in the boat with their arms in the air, flailing about in fear. But Jesus, again, He's moved by compassion, so He doesn't let them remain in this state of terror. And the text indicates this to us because it says that immediately, right? So, you can almost imagine somebody walks into a room, it scares you, and you oh, no, 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 it's okay, it's just me. That's what's going on here. As soon as Jesus sees there's been a misunderstanding, they think I'm a ghost, they don't recognize me. He reaches out with His words immediately and dispels their fear. And it says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus reveals Himself to them in their fear, to dispel their fear, 
to take it away. How often Jesus does this for us when we're afraid. Even It might even be Him coming to us and we don't recognize Him working. And it doesn't quite dispel our fear until He comes and reveals exactly who He is. And that's the mercy of God at work in Jesus. That's what He came to do, to reveal God to us. He, it turns out, isn't an angry judge that's seeking to judge you for all the wrongs you do. He doesn't want to condemn you. In fact, what's revealed to us in Jesus is the compassion and the mercy and the love of God. But Peter, classic Peter, which before we get too harsh on Peter, just so you know, Peter's you, Peter's me. That's not enough for Peter, Jesus himself saying, oh, I'm Jesus, don't be afraid. So Peter has to demand for some proof. He says, and that's quite an arrogant and unfaithful thing to do when Jesus himself says, here, I'm Jesus, don't be afraid. Peter says, well, Lord, if it really is you, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Does Jesus get angry at Peter for challenging him or not trusting in his words? No. Instead, he simply says, come. Come. So here we see the continued compassion of Jesus. He's always making the first move. Well, Peter gets out of the boat, and what do you know? He walks on the water. I feel like the first hundred times I read this story, I just kind of read that verse and went on. But Peter, a regular human being, is walking on the water, all because Jesus told him to come. And so as Peter's walking on the water, as long as he's looking at Jesus, he's fine. But then something happens. And remember the setting here, right? This isn't just like a a nice calm lake. This is the Sea of Galilee with winds so strong that a bunch of grown men can't deal with it. So it's a pretty scary sight. Well, Peter stops looking at Jesus, and instead he looks at the wind. And the text tells us that his fear returns. He becomes afraid. And he begins to sink. Now, at this point, if Jesus were anyone other than Jesus, this is probably the reaction they would have. (sighs) What do I have to do? I came to you to help you in your situation at first, You started screaming like a bunch of children and thought I was a ghost. I told you who I was, and then you asked for proof. I gave you proof, and you're still sinking in fear. What can I do? Well, fortunately, it is Jesus and not one of us in this situation, because I would certainly be frustrated. But Jesus is not. Jesus still moved by compassion. The text indicates again with this word, immediately. He doesn't wait to say, okay, well, maybe he'll figure it out. He doesn't wait to say, well, you kind of deserve to be a little bit afraid because you didn't trust me. No, instead it says, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. When it just doesn't waste any time. He doesn't waste any time reaching out to his disciples in their fear and their helplessness. Immediately, the text says, He spoke His word, and He reached out His hand when His disciples were afraid. Dear friends in Christ, He does that for you as well. God doesn't mess around with mercy and compassion. He sends Jesus, and Jesus takes quick action. Now, He does give a small rebuke, as a loving father would give a child. O you of little faith! Why did you doubt? And I have to admit that made me think of the times where I have worry about some future thing that God has taken care of hundreds of times in my life already, and I think to myself, you'd think I would learn. God's going to take care of it this time too. I don't have anything to worry about, but yet... Jesus says to us, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
Then Peter is brought into the boat by Jesus, and something incredible happens. The wind ceases. It just stops. A situation that seemed so helpless and overwhelming to us when Jesus shows up, it's dispelled completely. No big deal. It turns out it's within His power to deal with. Now, what did the disciples do when that happened? It's almost like the scales covering their eyes were removed. What's their first confession of who Jesus is when He shows up in the story? It's that He's a ghost, and they're frightened of Him. Now, part of that misunderstanding is because the disciples don't really understand yet who Jesus is. They think He's a prophet or a great teacher. So it makes sense then when a prophet or a great teacher, at least you think so, starts showing up by walking on an ocean, you're like, I don't, prophets and teachers don't really do that kind of stuff. So it sort of makes sense they don't recognize Him. But Jesus still reaches out, still comes to them. And by the time He gets into the boat, it becomes clear to the disciples, at least for now, who Jesus is. They worship Him. And the Scriptures are quite clear about who is to be worshipped. It's only God. Right in the book of Isaiah, he starts to bend down and worship to an angel because he's so in awe of how he looks, and the angel immediately dissuades him from doing that because the only one worthy of worship is God. So in their action, they worship God, and in their words, they confess Him truly for the first time in the story. Truly, you are the Son of God. Now the disciples understand. Now they get it. Now they understand who's in the boat with them. Well, dear friends in Christ, Jesus does the same thing for you. The law of the text today is that it reveals to us that we are utterly dependent on God, that we are a people ruled by our fears because we know there are lots of situations that are outside of our control, and that frightens us because as sinful human creatures, we like to be in control. Often in, in pastoral ministry, the most fruitful times for the gospel are these sorts of situations because the law has thoroughly killed any hope you have in your own power to save your situation. And you quite naturally cry out for help. And who shows up but Jesus? The law continues in this text, even when Jesus is right there. We don't recognize Him sometimes. And even when He tells us, hey, it's me, we're still not always convinced, but thanks be to God that it isn't one of us in the place of Jesus because we would have given up on, we would have given up on ourselves long ago, but Jesus does not. Instead, He immediately speaks and He immediately reaches out His hand to take hold of you because all those situations that are too big for you are not too big for Him. After all, walking on water is not something a mere teacher or prophet does, but only the Son of God. So you may not realize it, but you actually just went through this story this morning, and it's going to continue once the sermon is done. You are out in the middle of the ocean this week, working against forces that you can't defeat, not only outside of yourself, but within your own heart. And into that situation comes Jesus. Here to you today, He has spoken His Word. He has revealed Himself to you as a merciful and loving God who desires to reach out and save you, to take care of the things that you cannot. And maybe you're not quite yet convinced that He really loves you. And so you ask for a sign or some proof or in your prayers, you want Him to show you that He's really listening. We don't have any right to make that demand of God, neither did Peter. And yet, what is His response to us but, you are forgiven, I love you, you are mine. 
and our eyes again each Sunday are drawn to Jesus. Now, like Peter, they're not going to stay there. You're going to go out from here today, and you're going to see the winds again, and you're going to be afraid, and you're going to start to sink. But I'm here to tell you not to be afraid, because when you do start to sink, immediately Jesus will reach out His hand and take hold of you. This is why we talk about on Sunday it being the work of God that is happening here, not our own. It is God speaking to you. It is God reaching out to you with His gifts to remind you to look at Him because He's right here with you. And then when we finally realize who's with us, we can, like the disciples, worship Him truthfully. No longer are you terrified and afraid that He's someone else or that He's not there, but we can say, along with the disciples in our worship today, truly, you are the Son of God. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God which passes our understanding guard your hearts and minds in situations that are beyond your control with the promise that Jesus will come and the knowledge that it is not too big for Him to deal with until He comes again to take us all to be with Him forever. Amen.